right? It is 9 o'clock. I'm going to uh, get started with an all new homework assignment. Okay, you guys have been enjoying a break from homework assignments. So now we have a new homework assignment. It's based on the board game called Mastermind. Um, how many people know of this particular board game? Okay, it's kind of a fun deal board game. Um, there are variants of this particular game, but this is what the board you know, kind of looks like. You know, it's a two-player game. Uh, what usually happens is one person would act, you know, as the quote-unquote spy or the person who's hiding a particular color pattern from the other person. So the other person will um, kind of try to guess what the color pattern is by you know, putting these packs into the, the, the main part of this board. So this is called, this is the main part of the board, like this part here. And then these are for scoring. Okay, so these little smaller packs are for scoring. Um, this is one configuration, you know, the, the one that I usually play with is a smaller one. It's an even more portable version of a mastermind. Um, there are, you know, different ways to solve problems. And what I'll do is I'm gonna describe the game first. You can read the rest on uh, Wikipedia, and I'm pretty sure there are other um, places where you can look up the instructions. This one is actually, this is actually a pretty good one too. This one is actually online, and uh, so what you do is you uh, try to guess the pattern. In this particular version, the computer is playing the spy and I'm going to play the decoder. So my job is to decode and figure out what those question marks are based on the feedback of my initial guesses. Okay? So what I'll do is I'm going to give it a try so that you guys can get an idea of what it looks like. So I'm guessing it's just drag and drop here or not. Oh, okay, I see. Click. And oh, I need to start a new game. Sorry? The first start on the bottom. Start on the bottom. bottom. Oh, start here. And then click check after that. So I'm going to try, you know, red, uh, red, red, red. Click check. And there's no match here. Okay? So in this case, you can see the scoring of, these, of this particular color pattern is all empty, which means, you know, I did not match anything in terms of color or position. Um, Next one is going to be green. There are different ways to play this game. You know, this is the quote unquote easier way to do it. Um, a red pack as a score, you know, sometimes they use a black pack instead of a, a, a red pack, means it's both right in terms of color and position. So all I know is one of the four green packs is at the right place and it's the right color. But that's not surprising because they're all green, right? So at this point, I know there's one green, but I have no idea where it is because I have four greens here. So the next guess is going to have one green and then three blues. And I have now the green, and one of the blue is at the right is the right color at the right position. So at this point, I know the green has got to be right. Is that okay? Sorry. It's not possible because. When I had uh, four greens, you know, I already got one red peg. So because of that, if I keep a green here, I should get at least one white peg because of the green. Because it's all, I know there's, there's one green peg in the color pattern. I don't know where it is, but I know there's at least one. So by, by changing the other three to blue, now I know there's at least one green and one blue. But by knowing that I have two pegs that are both in terms of position and color. I know the green has got to be in, in, has got to be right in terms of both color and position. And then the three blue, you know, I don't know where it is supposed to be. It can be any one of these three positions. Okay. So the next one is going to be one green, one blue, and one two yellows. I mean, there are different ways to play this game, and this is probably not the optimal way to do it. Oh, I, I said one thing, I did another. Okay, fine. But from here, I know the, uh, well, it's still not wasted, okay? I can still learn from this particular guess because what I know is uh, there's one blue and the blue is not here. Okay, so the blue has to be here, the green has to be here, and there are no, no yellows. 
So it's not wasted, you know, even though I, I did make a mistake, but I, still, I can still salvage and get you know, as much information out of it as possible. The green has got to be here. I know the blue, there's one blue, it could be here, could be here. There are no yellows, so I'm going to go move on to beige or brown and put both of those here. Check. Well, that's not bad. <coughs> So at this point, I know the green is right. The green is already settled. It's the other three positions that I have to worry about. I know there's one blue and there's one brown, OK? One of them is giving me the white peg because it is the right color at the wrong place. The other one is giving me a red peg because it is the right color and the right position. Are we doing OK so far with this, OK? So the way you play the game you know, as a human is you try to deduce as much as you can based on not only one row of the guess, but based on all of the rows. So you try to rule out the impossible color patterns. And of the remaining ones, you just pick one and go like, OK, I'll try this one. OK. So we know the green is here. So that is all settled. We don't know whether it is the brown ones that is accounted for one of the red ones and then the Blue is accounting for the white one, or vice versa. Okay, can anyone tell me, you know, is there any evidence to tell you that is it the blue that is giving you the red, or is it one of the browns that, that's giving you the red? Hmm? I cannot tell right now, okay? But I know there's one more color. So I know there's one green, which is okay. The green is already done, so I know the green has got to be here. I know there's one blue. At this point, I don't seem to know where the blue is supposed to be. So I'm going to try a different position for the blue. And I know there's one brown. And I know there's one other color. So let's say the orange is here. Check. OK, so I know at least there's no orange. And I'm still getting two red here and one white. OK. Um, so we'll do a green, definitely a green here. And we know that this position is not done yet. So I'm, I'm going to try a black peg. I'll try a black peg here, try a blue peg over here, and try a brown peg over here. Now at this point, you know, I have enough guesses where I can actually try to work my way backwards and see if it is consistent with all the previous guesses. In other words, I look at this combination and say, what if this is the actual hidden combination, the hidden pattern? And then I try to see if it's consistent with all of the other guesses that have made so far. Okay? So this is a good illustration of what you have to do. So, so this is not just me playing a game, online game. It is actually demonstrating what your program has to do. Okay. So if this is the actual hidden pattern, how would it score the previous one? That's the question. The green is at the right position, the right color. So it would have given me one of the reds. OK, that's fine. If the blue is actually here, this blue would have given me a white. But this brown would also give me another white, which means it is being inconsistent with the previous four. So that tells me this color pattern is wrong. It cannot be you know, configured this way. Okay. So let's see if I can make another one that makes it consistent. So I would make the brown here instead and put the black pack over here. OK. So let's take a look at this particular color pattern and see if it's consistent with not only the previous, but all of the previous you know, guesses that I've made so far. The green accounts for one red. The brown accounts for the other red. The blue accounts for one white. So far, so good. What about two uh, guesses ago? The green gives me one red, and the rest is inconsistent. So I know this cannot be the pattern either. So this is how you, you know, as you continue to have more guesses, um, you can, you can actually you know, make the next one, you know, more educated. In other words, you can. Um, okay, so what if this is the black and the blue is here? That won't work either. And 
what if the brown is here and the black is here? No. That would that would work. Okay, let's double check. So we'll compare this to my previous test, okay? One red tag, another red tag. Now whatever you match with red tags, in other words, both the color and the position is right, you don't match it with the white tags anymore. So what that means is each peg in the color pattern can only be matched once. And you look for color and position right first. Once you match those pegs, they won't be considered again for other types of matches. Are we doing okay so far with this example? So this will give me one red, this will give me another red, and this will give me a white tag. So, so far so good. Match against the two guesses ago. One red, two reds, one um, white. So, so far so good. What about this brown one? It's not going to be matched because this one is already matched with this one here. So this guy does not match with the other one because it's already matched. Are we doing okay so far with the rules? It's already written in the homework assignment as well, and you can also do a Wikipedia search for it. But I just want to do a demonstration to make sure that you guys kind of understand all the rules of matching. What about this one here? Okay. Uh, the blue is over here. That will give me one white tag. It's all good. But why is there only one white tag? What about this blue here? Well, remember, once you match it, it you don't need to consider a color tag in either pattern. So when I use this uh, blue tag to match this blue tag here, the other blue tag has nothing to match to it. What about this one? Green, blue, it's good. Uh, just green and no red. So, so far this pattern does match all of the previous guesses. So that makes, makes it a reasonable guess for this turn. Is it the best guess for this turn? Well, maybe, maybe not, okay? You know, because there are ways to determine whether a particular guess, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's how the game is played. Are there any questions about the mastermind game? So there, there can't be more than one color, like each yes. bag is different color. Correct. Okay. The, how you, how the, the spy chooses the color pattern, each color is, com or each peg position is independent from the other ones. So you can end up with red, 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 red as the actual you know, pattern to match. Yep. So the second player just chooses the mystery pattern? The second player who is the decoder is going to attempt to find out what is the actual pattern okay. by making these guesses. The spy just picks the pattern? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions about this one? So this is actually a pretty good you know, demonstration because it is interactive and, you know, I'm not sure whether it, you have the ability. Oh, I did not say allow duplicates. So if you check allow duplicates, then you can have the same color reappearing. So with, with this one, I, since I did not check it, you know, it, on, it can only have one color can only appear at the most once in the actual color pattern. So I did not really have to guess you know, red, 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 and blue, 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 blue to begin with. Are there any questions about this, uh, how to play the mastermind game? Or at least just the scoring part? Any questions? No questions? Okay, let's start a new game just to be sure that we understand. And I really enjoy it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this time I, I did allow duplicates, okay? And I would use the same strategy. This may or may not be the best little strategy, but this is usually how I do it. <clears throat> okay, no reds. What about greens? No greens. Blues. Okay, we have one blue. Okay, so with one blue, I can put the blue any place. It doesn't really matter, okay? And then we'll try the yellows. Okay, so we know the blue is not here and there are no yellows. And then we'll try the browns. And try blue at a slightly different position. Okay, we know that there's one brown and one blue. Okay. So now the question is, do we know which one is giving us the red peg and which one is giving us the white peg? 
Yes, we do. <laughs> the, 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 the red peg cannot be because of the blue. Okay, let's think about why, okay? If the red peg is coming from the blue, then the brown peg must be given as the white peg, right? Because it is, but if, if the blue peg is both position and color right, then the brown peg has to be color and position right as well because it fills up all the other positions. So it has to be the other way around. The brown tag is the one that is giving me a red tag, which means it's both color and position correct. And the blue tag is still at the wrong place. So we know there's one brown. We don't quite know exactly where it is, um, but it's one of these three positions. We know the, the blue tag is not supposed to be here. So now we can put a blue here and a brown you know, somewhere where these three positions are, I, I do not want to put the brown here because we know the brown definitely is not there. Okay. All right, let's go put it here and then the brown will put it, other than here, the, the other two positions are both just as good. And then we have oranges after that. Okay, so we don't have any orange colors and we are still um, having a red peg and one white peg. Um, at this point, the blue can be here, the brown can be here, and then we'll put two black pegs over here. Okay, let's double check and see if this is consistent with all of the previous guesses. The brown is giving me a red peg compared to the second second guess. The, the blue one is giving me a white peg. So far so good. The brown is giving me the red peg. The blue is giving me the white peg. Are we still doing okay so far? Does everybody kind of understand the rules of how you assign the red pegs and the white peg? That's about this. What about this one? We have one white peg, which is correct. This one has one white peg and it is correct. None of the other two. So, so far this guess is just as good. Well, not just as good, but it's a reasonable guess, okay? It is not conflicting with any of the previous guesses. Check. All right. We are definitely onto something here. All right. So we know we have all the four colors um, correct, okay? We know one is at the right position. So I'm guessing the brown, okay, that is, okay, so we don't know which one is giving me the right color. It can be the, okay, so we know there are two, three that are position right, one is color right. No, three are just color right, and one is position and color right. So now we have to carefully think about this. Did I make a mistake before, the previous one? Try out different combinations. I'm still thinking about the, this particular guess here. It doesn't seem. I'm guessing the brown still has to be here, but if the brown is here, then the blue, it doesn't make sense. The brown cannot be here. I think the blue's third peg is, I think it's black, black, uh, blue, brown. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's check against the consistency with all the previous guesses. So <coughs> that, that means, you know, when I made this one, you know, I made a mistake. Yeah, I can say this one. Okay, that's one. So that's one red and one white. So it's consistent with this guess. And we have one white here. So it's not wasted. I don't see it being wasted. Okay, let's check the new one. So we have one red, <coughs> one white, two 
two bytes and three bytes. So it's consistent with the previous guess. What about two guesses before? We have one red and one white. That's correct. And with the one before, we have one red and one white. So far so good. And then with this one, the blue gives us the right tag. This is very likely to be the correct answer. Let's check. Yay, good job. So I'm pretty sure you guys are starting to get the hang of it, you know, the rules of this particular game. I'm not asking you to write the row of the decoder. I just want you to score two color patterns. That's all your next homework assignment is about. Now in time, depending on how the semester goes, we might actually play the role of the decoder. In other words, you will be the spy, okay? You keep your pattern hidden, and then the computer will try to guess. And then you have to tell the computer, okay, you got you know, one white, right, a red pack and two white packs. And then the computer will use that information or history of all the guesses to come up with the next one. Which is, which most of you might think, oh, well, then that's gonna be hard. It's actually a lot simpler than what you think. Because it's just a process of el el elimination. You're just getting rid of the impossible ones. And then whatever is remaining, you just pick one and you'll see if it is the, the answer. So are we doing okay so far with this? Now, for whatever reason, I thought you know, the red packs or the black packs, and um, is, so the, the scoring is done differently. So maybe it's just because I misread the rules or you know, the one that I played with it was a little different. All right, so this is your homework assignment. It's mastermind scoring, which is going to be the basis of another project in the future. Um, the setup is just to uh, set up a subfolder called mastermind, all lowercase. The, the source code should be in main.cpp and also mm for mastermind.cpp. So there are two source files in this case, plus one header file. I will show you guys how to set it up later. What the program does, the program is going to read two lines from the standard input file. Assume the first line is the hidden pattern and the second line is the actual guess. The program will compute the score in number of black and white pegs. So you know, in my tech description, the number of black pegs is the same thing as the number of red pegs. So one black peg means there's one peg in the color pattern that is both correct in terms of color and position. And this is a quick introduction, you know, so I'm, you know, this part is just a repetition of what we talked about earlier, except this is not nearly as interactive. So the most important part is pegs that are matched should not be matched again. In other words, if, if one peg is already matched because it is both color and position correct, then you should not match it again against anything else when you're trying to figure out the number of white pegs. Is that okay? Because that is a very you know, important rule. Um, so in the program, instead of using colors, I just want you to use uh, digits from zero to five. Instead of having eight possible colors, we're dealing with only six different colors. Um, and these are examples. If the hidden pattern is one, two, four, four, and the guess is four, two, one, one, then you will have one uh, black peg because the two matches both the color and the position. And then you have three, uh, you have two white pegs because this one is matching one of these ones here, doesn't matter which one, but it's, co it's, color, posi it's color correct, but position incorrect. And then this four is the same thing, it is the wrong place because it's matching this four here. So are there any questions about the scoring of this particular pattern combination? Yep. How the program responds. Yeah. Um, I will describe what the program is supposed to do. But this is these are examples of how to score. Okay. Now, if the hidden pattern is one two four four and the guess is four four two two, then these two fours, even though they are matching these two fours, but because they are positioned incorrect, they only receive white pegs. In addition to the to the two fours, we also have one two here that is at the wrong place. And that's why we have three white packs as a total score in this case. 
So here comes a big question. Can you receive four white pegs? The answer is yes, you can. If the hidden pattern is one, two, three, four, and the guess is four, two, three, one, then you end up with exactly four white pegs because you have all the right colors, but they're all at the wrong position. The hidden pattern is one, two, four, four. The guess is one, four, two, four. So in this case, we have two black pegs. One black peg for this four, because it is both color and position right. One black peg for this one, which is also color and position correct. The other two at the four, which are the middle ones, they're both the right color, but the, at the wrong place. Is that okay so far? So out of these examples, I think you should be able to figure out you know, how to write out the rules. The hidden pattern is one, two, four, four. The guess is one, three, four, five. So in this case, we have two black pegs because the one and the four are both color and position correct. And then there's no white peg in this case because the three does not match the two here, in any, does not match anything else. Uh, the five also does not match anything in the hidden pattern. Is that okay? All right. So this is how you structure your code, which is really important. Uh, the first thing is you want to create a header file called mm.h. The name is important because you know I am going to uh, make assumptions. You know, with this is going to be an assumption when I grade your homework assignment. And this is the content of mm.h. <clears throat> if ndef is basically said if not defined mm, dot mm, mm underscore h all in uppercase, and it is matched with this end if here. In other words, the rest of this file, which is this content here, is only going to be compiled or processed if mm.h is not defined as a macro. Okay? This is a mechanism to make sure that even if this header file is pound included multiple times, it's not going to give you any problem of you know redefining stuff. Okay, it's a fairly standard approach to do things in C and C plus plus programming using headers. The actual content of this header file is basically this portion here. The first two are just defining two constants. Uh, mm pattern length is defined to be four, and mm under number of colors is defined to be six. So in this case, I'm basically saying there are four pegs in each color pattern. And then each peg can choose from zero to five. There are six choices for each uh, peg in the color pattern. Are we doing okay so far with these numbers, or the meaning of these particular numbers? Okay. And then I define a structure. And this is you know, a structure that combines what we know about structures as well as arrays. Because we have pattern being a member of this structure, but that particular member is an array all by itself. Okay. Um, would that cause any problems? No. You know, a, a member is just a particular part of a structure, and it can have it can be of any type. And then we have uh, the score. You know, the scoring black pegs and the scoring white pegs here. And then we have the prototype of three functions. The first function is mmread. You know, I describe the behavior of these functions later on. The second one is mmprintscore. And then the last one is mmscore, which is the one that is probably the most complicated one. So what you want to do is in the file mm.cpp, mastermind.cpp, you will implement those three functions. Okay, don't do it anywhere else, okay? Just in mm.cpp. The behavior of these three functions are described here. MM read is going to read a color pattern from standard input file. Read the correct number of integers into the guest structure pointed to by parameter PG. So when you look at parameter PG, it is a pointer to a struct guest, and a struct guest is looks like this, so you have to read it into the pattern part. Are we doing okay so far with uh, what MM read is supposed to do? There's no need to do error checking or error recovery. In other words, you can assume the input file is formatted correctly. Okay? All the integers are separated either by a space or a line feed. So there's no need to worry about, but what if someone gives me a lowercase character? Now, nah, don't, don't worry about it. Okay? 
Because that's not the focus of this program. The focus of this program is the scoring part. The second function is called MM print score. Um, this is a typo, it's not multiple, it is just print score. What it will do is to print the members score black packs and score white packs from the guest structure pointed to by PG. You just need to print the numbers in this particular order. So you want to print the number of black packs first and then print the number of white packs separated by a line feed. Okay? If there are like, let's say two black packs and one white pack, <coughs> you print two, new line, one, new line. That's all I need. Okay. And then the last one is going to be the most complicated function, which is MM score. MM score does not perform any type of input output. Instead, what it does is it will score the pattern already stored in the guest structure pointed to by PG assuming the hidden pattern is in the array hidden. When you look at the prototype, you can see the hidden is the first parameter, and then the pointer to the structure is the second parameter. Are we doing okay so far in terms of uh, what the functions are supposed to do? Is that okay? All right. In the main file, okay, the main .cpp, this is what you can do. I mean, you can just, um, I made one mistake here. It is inconsistent with my description. It's not gonna affect much, but you know, I still wanna fix it first. So let me fix this first, and then I'll go back and explain. Well, as I go back and fix it, I'll explain which part is reversed. And there's also code in here that you can borrow. So you can take a close look. So it has to do with this part here. I'm supposed to read into the into the pattern of the guess after I read in the actual hidden pattern. So I have to reverse the order of those two. That's it. That's the only thing I need to fix. And let's set the display. Okay, the reason why I have to do this is because the behavior of the program is to assume the first line is the hidden pattern. <coughs> the, without fixing this first, the, the program or in the code in main.cpp would actually read the pattern into the guest structure first, which is the reverse of what I mentioned here. So that's why I need to make it consistent. It won't change the scoring anyway, you know, but it is you know, something that I should fix. So this is the main program, and now the indentation is wrong, but that's okay, you know, it was it will still compile, it just looks doesn't look very you know good. Okay. Are there any questions about the main program? <coughs> can a, can anyone tell which part of the main program you can lift and put it into your own code? Scan that. Yep. The reading of the integers into the pattern. Well, you have to make some changes to it, you know, but it, for the most part, it's, it's here already, okay? So it would be going, well, I'm not gonna say it again because I, I'll just tell you that there's one part of this program that you can pretty much copy, paste, and change a few things and make that your own function, okay? Are there any questions about uh, the homework assignment up to this point? Questions. Okay. Okay. To properly make an executable, because now we have two source files and one header file, what you need to do is to either do it by hand or use a make file. I will describe what to what a make file is and how to use it. And this is how the, the program is going to be graded. It will be graded first <coughs> partially by a script. In other words, a script will decompress your submission and you know, it will do the basic running and then I will visually check the code as, uh, as a part of the process too. The only part portion I will take from your submission is mm.cpp. Now this is a very important part. What this means is when I grade your homework assignment, I might use a different mm.h file, but it will still be consistent with the mm.h file that is described here. So let's go back to the mm.h file and I can tell you what I mean when I said, you know, I'll give you, when I grade it, it will be slight, it can be different. In other words, I can change this to have 
you know, the pattern length to be five, I can change the number of colors to be seven or eight or whatever number I choose to use. I, in the structure itself, I can reorder any one of these members. I can change the ordering of all the members. Should not change your, should not affect your code at all. Is that making any sense? Okay, because, n because your code should not depend on the ordering of the members inside the structure. Is that okay? Um, these I cannot really do much about, okay, so these would still be the same. So what I really can do is to change this number, change this number, reorder the members, and that should not affect your program in mm.cpp at all. So that's what it means when I said, you know, I would only use mm.cpp from your submission. That also means that you can include other files if you want to. You can include your own main.cpp, doesn't bother me. Um, your own mm.h doesn't bother me either because my grading script will overwrite those files before running a test. Um, so that's uh, the last sentence here is the most important part. It means that your mm.cpp should not make any assumptions other than what is included, what is defined in mm.h. So don't use an integer like four, okay, when you declare a local array for processing. Don't just say four, assuming you know four is the length of a pattern. Use the constant definition in mm.h. That is you know, the most important part. <coughs> and to turn it in is the usual stuff. You know when you are in the mastermind working directory, you know just run this command here. And I'm just visually double check that this is correct um, to create the archive file and then turn in the archive file. Are there any questions about the homework assignment? Just you know how to set it up and stuff like that. No questions. All right. So what I'll do is I'm going to kind of run through this whole thing and give you an idea of, of what a make file is and how to make <coughs> use of a make file in this particular case. Well, we'll do it first without the make file, and then we'll do it with the make file. So what I'll do is I'm going to do something that you probably will have to do as well you know, when you're working on your homework assignment. I'm going to use this particular text box for the demonstration. This stuff here goes to mm.h as a header file. So I do a copy, and I'll just go over here and create my, create my mastermind folder here. And this is something that I can do <coughs> easily in Linux, but in, um, in Windows, you cannot do it directly with the console of QEMU. If you use PuTTY to connect to the virtual machine, you can do it in PuTTY as well. So it all depends on how you set up your workflow. So just put a paste here, type a control D at the end, and then I can now go back to the header file. It has a whole bunch of empty space here. I don't think it interferes with anything. You know, I'm just going to leave it as it is um, for now. And then I'll go to my main.cpp, which is down here, copy, paste, control D to end it. Okay, so now I want to at least be able to compile, so I'm going to use a warn all dash C just to compile the main.cpp file. It's not going to work because I don't have the definitions of any of the three functions that I'm supposed to implement. So the program is not going to work in any way. But I, can, I should still be able to compile the main.cpp file. It's complaining scanf was not declared in this scope, so you have to fix that too in your code. Well, I'm going to fix it for you. OK, it's complaining scanf <coughs> is not defined here. OK, how should I fix it? XDDIO in <laughs> as a header file. OK, very good. So I like that answer. Let me fix it for you so that when you copy and paste it, this part would not be a problem. standard I.O. is not really quite as simple as just include standard I.O. 
because this is in HTML. I cannot just type the uh, less than symbol because it's the beginning of a of an element in HTML. So I have to escape it using the ampersand lt stdio.h and then ampersand gt ampersand semicolon. Pre encode everything in HTML first. So I'm going to display just to make sure that it is all fixed here. Okay, so it does have pound include pound include stdio.h. And now if I go back to my main program and fix that here too. And it does compile. Okay. Well, but why would it compile? <coughs> I did not even write, you know, the a single line of code for all the mm functions. Why would it compile? Well, why would it not compile? Does anyone think you know the program should not compile at all as it is now? No one. But what about the missing functions? Why doesn't that bother the compiler at all? Well, you know the reason that for this program to compile is um, right? you may not have the, the everything that you need, but it will not uh, act as it should be. It cannot run as a program, right? Yes. Okay, but it's still okay to compile because mm.h is telling the compiler everything it needs to know to make to compile this program. In other words, on line 12, okay, on line 12, it, it's supposed to call mm read. The compiler is not complaining because the compiler says, oh, someone told me about mm read already, about you know how what kind of parameter it is expecting, what kind of return value it is going to have, which is none, right? So the compiler knows exactly how to deal with mm read. The same thing for mm score and mm print score. Well, even though those functions are not defined, it doesn't bother the compiler. It would bother the linker to no end, but it does not bother the compiler. How many people still remember the distinction between a compiler and a linker? Did we talk about that? We talked about that, right? Yeah. So in this case, you know, we have one chapter written, okay? It does have references to somewhere, something that is not in here, but that's not the job of the compiler, okay? That's the job of the linker. So if I were to write a program to make this you know, at least run, this is the minimal way to do it. I can go to mm.h, oops, mm.cpp, and I can just do the minimum to make this compile. Okay? So I'm just going to say void mm <coughs> read uh, struct yes, pg. And now this is a function definition. Instead of using a semicolon at the end, which is a prototype, if I use open and close curly brace on line four and line five in this case, it becomes an actual function definition. Does it do anything useful? No, but it is a definition. It does make the linker happy. Um, I can now have you know mm score, <coughs> which expects you know int what was it again hidden, and it's just an array, and then struct. Yes, PG again. And once again, I will leave it empty. And with MM brain score, I'm going to do the same thing here. And I will make it empty as well. So when I look at the folder, now I have, okay, let me just make sure that the whole class can see this part. Um, so right now I have two source files, okay? One is main.cpp, that part is but part of it is hidden. This is outside of the projector range. So we have main.cpp as a source file. We have mm.cpp also as a source file. mm.h is usually not called a source file. Instead, it is just called a header file. It only contains the necessary uh, definitions, but not really the code of this particular program. So how do I make an executable out of this? Oh, I can compile the other program. I can compile mm.cpp now that I have it, right? So mm.cpp is now compiled separately. So when I look at the files in this folder, now I have 
main.o corresponding to main.cpp, I have mm.o corresponding to mm.cpp. Those two are object files. They are output from the compiler. Where's my executable? It's not here. So to make an executable out of this whole thing, I have to do a G++ again. This time I use dash O to specify the output, which is the executable. We can call it main, doesn't really matter. Now you have to supply the input with main.o, which is the object file from compiling main.cpp, and mm.o, which is the object file from compiling mm.cpp. Press the enter key, now we have the executable called main, which is the first file in this folder. Okay, are we still doing okay so far with this process? Instead of using one single source file, now we have two source files with this project. Are there any questions at this point? So the main.cpp will call on the m and .cpp? Say that again? So the main will call upon well, main as, a, as an executable is the whole thing, okay? It, it's called an executable because you can run the program with that file. <coughs> it's kind of like, um, it's like have, having multiple chapters put into a single book. Each individual chapter is a .o file. So we have main.o as one chapter, we have mm.o as another chapter, but each chapter is not self-contained as a book because it might have references to something other than the chapter itself. But when you look at main, it does not have unresolved references. You know, all the references to mm read, mm print score, and mm score, they're all done by the linker. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run the program main. <coughs> And what it's doing right now is waiting for me to enter four integers because right now the length of each pattern is only four. So I can enter like zero, space, one, space, two, space, three, press the enter key, and it doesn't do a single thing. Why would, why would it do anything when I did not specify the actual code to do anything? So it's a good template, okay? So as it is right now, it's, it's a good template. Are there any questions about this whole process? which is kind of cumbersome and lengthy because you have to compile each .cpp file to the .o <coughs> file. Every time you make a change to the .cpp, you have to recompile. But once you have a new .o file, you also have to relink, which is a hassle, okay? If you forget to do one of the two steps, your executable is not going to match the source code, which is a, which is a problem because when you debug it, you know, that won't work very well. Are there any questions about this? Yep. So the the mm.cpp mm -hmm. is uh, being called by the header file. No, it's, it's well, it's thing. kind of the other way around. Okay, so let let's take a look at all of these files and find out you know how they relate to each other. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just going to do it on the whiteboard here because it's just easier. Okay, so the first <coughs> file that we have is called mm.h. This is called a header file. Uh, it contains the definitions that needs to be known to both main.cpp and mm.cpp. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay, so mm.h does not include any actual code to do anything, but it contains the definitions that is needed in order for, in order for main to know what it can do with a guest structure and also in order for mm.cpp to know the details of the structure. This is the file that needs to be shared between main.cpp and mm.cpp. Is that okay? So now we have main.cpp and mm.cpp. These two are called source files. They actually include um, statements to tell the computer what to do, okay? Step-by-step -step instructions. So they're both related to mm.h because both main.cpp and mm.cpp will count include main, uh, mm.h. Is that okay? What, what that also means is every time we make changes to mm.h, 
you have to recompile main.cpp and mm.cpp because any change to mm.h can potentially change how the code in main.cpp and also mm.cpp will work. Does that make any sense? So the arrows are indicating dependency. Okay. From main.cpp, we compile, and then we, as a result of compiling, we have main.o, which is an object file. An object file is a translated version of a C++ file. It is in, in machine code already. But it, it cannot run. It cannot run it because it may contain unresolved references. Like in this case, main.o will have un unresolved references to mm read, mm print score, and then also mm score. So you cannot run it yet. Okay. Um, the other .o file is mm.o. It is an object file by compiling mm.cpp. This one may contain unresolved references as well, like scanf or some other things. And then we have main, which is the actual executable, depending on both main.o and mm.o. It is an executable. As an executable, it means there are no unresolved references. Okay? And that's the job of a linker. Now, when we ran the command line, you know, it, they're both G++, but by passing different parameters or options to G++, it takes it took on a different role each time we ran G++. Are we doing okay so far with all this stuff here? So the command involved in all of these dependencies, this one is basically running G++ with a dash O as an option. These ones are basically running G++ with your usual stuff, which is warn all, uh, dash G to include debug information, and a dash C to mean that we only want to compile but not link. Okay. These ones are not actual command, com these are not commands. How does mm.cpp make use of mm.h? It's in the source file itself. Which line does it? Starts with a pound. Pound and blue, exactly. But it is not a command that is making mm.cpp relate to mm.h. It is the pound include line of the source file that establishes the dependency in this case. Are we doing okay so far in terms of uh, the interdependencies of these files? Is that okay so far? But that's a lot of stuff for you to track, okay? Because it means every time you make changes to one of these three files, you will have to do something to make the executable updated. Does that make any sense? Let's, let's, let's try to look at a few examples. If you make changes to mm.h, okay, then everything that depends on mm.h needs to be updated. Well, you may not be changing main.cpp or mm.cpp, but since they, have, they might have references to things that you have changed up here, the object file will also be changed, which means you have to recompile your mm.o and main.o and mm.o files. But once you have new object files, you will have to relink to get it executable. So that means if you make changes to mm.h, everything has to be done again. What about you make changes only to, let's say, mm.cpp? Which is more likely than not, that's the only file that you need to make changes to. Who depends on mm.cpp? Does mm.h depends on mm.cpp? No, the dependency goes the other way, right? What about main.o? Does that depend on mm.cpp? No, it's only mm.o that depends on mm.cpp. So when you make changes to mm.cpp, you only need to recompile mm.cpp so you will have an up-to-date version of mm.o. But now we have a potential issue. What about main as an executable? It has to be relinked. That's correct. Do you see how the color propagates? But to keep track of all of this stuff manually is a big hassle. In other words, 
if you make changes to ml.cpp and you forget one of these two steps, it's not going to work. You know, what, you what you will be debugging is going to be inconsistent with the source code. Are we making, is, is it making any sense? And do you think uh, you might make that mistake once in a while? Like, you know, you make changes to nm.cpp and then you only recompile but not relink, or you only relink without recompiling. I would have made those mistakes, okay? Especially when it's like 3 a.m. in the morning, you have the <coughs> calculus test the next day, and then the homework is also due the morning of the, of, of the same morning, okay? So that mistakes will be made. So we don't want to depend on ourselves to do all of this stuff manually, okay? So what is the solution to that? Script starter. Well, a script, but what we call that is not a script, it's called a make file, okay? I'm not gonna go into the, the gory details of a make file. What I will do is I'm just going to make it work with this particular class, and you guys can just copy and paste it. I'll put a link onto Moodle, okay? But I wanna show you what it looks like, okay? What At least what my version of the make file looks like. And you don't have to make any changes to the make file anymore, okay? So by the time you have it, it's all gonna work. All right, so to get to the make file, I'm going to go to another class because you know that's originally used in one of my other classes. So I'm gonna go to my CISP 310 class and look for a make file. <coughs> But I'm, I will use this as a template of what we are going to use today. Mm, may not be it. This is what a make file looks like. It really is just a text file um, with a whole bunch of definitions. I'm not gonna spend too much time to talk about this one here. The only thing I need to change would be a few things, then it will work for your homework assignment. Because we don't have any source files you know, specified as a C file, we only have C++ files. So we have main.cpp and also mm.cpp. And the, ex the name of the executable is still main. <coughs> that should be it. So we'll say clean. Again, yep, that works. It's automagical. <laughs> Okay, but let's let's check to make sure that it does work when we make changes to only one of the files. Remember what I said about uh, mm.h. So what if I what if I am to make changes to this file and just say this is the number of uh, pegs per color pattern? Okay, just adding some comments to the file. It doesn't really actually change anything. When I say make, which means we do things as necessary to give me the most up-to-date executable. What do you think it should do? It should recompile both of the CPP files, and then it should relink the .o files to the executable. Does that make any sense? Okay. So let's press the Enter key and see whether that's what it does. No, it does not. Okay, so we have a problem here. I think forgot to do one thing here and that's causing the problem. There we go. Let's do it one more time. And then do another change to mm.h. Just undo this part here. All I want to do is to change it a little bit. No, nope, don't want to encode. There we go. Okay, so let's make again. It's still complaining.
Oh, I see. My bad. I was copying and pasting, and then I forgot to make all the changes that I'm supposed to make. One more time, third time should be a charm. Okay, so let's <coughs> go ahead and do it one more time. Make changes to the header file. Just add a new line this time. Remake, and this time it does work, okay? Um, what's, what really is great about this make file is it can be used in all of your other classes. So when you take CISP 400 or 430, when you have you know, really kind of more complicated projects, this make file is easy to modify. The way it works, okay, let me just kind of show you how it works. Once you know, I set up the, the whole framework, it's easy. What you need to do is just to include as many source files as you need to include here. But what if a source file like a .cpp file has a header file that it depends on? You don't even need to express that. It will figure it out automatically. Like in this case, mm.cpp and main.cpp, they both pound include mm.h. And yet, we don't see any rules here that has anything that says, that says hey, if you change mm.h, you have to recompile the .cpp files and then relink to the executable. There's no rule explicitly stating that. That's because all of those dependencies are created in main.d and also mm.d as dependency files. And these are quote unquote included in the make file as well. So the whole thing is you know, really kind of automagical. That's, a, that's the best way to describe it. It's, it, it, it just works. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to upload this to Moodle, to this class. In fact, I'll just attach it to the homework assignment. So this way you have you know, that file as well. Just trying to find the best way to do it. Put it into the source code may not be the best idea because the tabs would have been lost and that would cause massive problems. So what I'll do is I'm going to put it into the attachment here, additional files, and we'll attach the make file, which is this file here. So now it is a part <coughs> of the homework assignment. So when you open the homework assignment, there will be a file quote unquote, attached to it. That would be the make file. Right. Are there any questions about this particular program, homework assignment? So now that you have a make file, do not run those individual commands anymore. Every time you make any changes to any of the source files and you're ready to run the program again, just say make. That's it. Make, enter. It doesn't matter which file you make changes to, make will take care of it. Well, to its best ability. Okay, let me show you why I said to its best ability. <coughs> so I'm going to go to mm.h and I'll start to do some implementation on mm.cpp. I'll make some implementations here. Okay, so I'm going to say um, int i. And I'll just say 4i equals 0. And you know, for whatever reason, I forgot to, I, you know, I didn't quite finish the program. Okay? This, is, this is all I wrote in the program. Well, make is not going to help in this case, right? It will stop. But it doesn't, it doesn't do anything in addition to what it could do. Okay? In other words, when it finds one compile time error, it will stop right there. It won't even bother the link and to give you something that you can run GDB on. Is that okay so far? Okay. Let me show you another thing that might be helpful. So let me <coughs> fix this first. And this time I can make again. But instead of making just main, which is by default, this is that's the default target, I'm going to main, make main.gdb. Okay. There is no such file called main.gdb. This is a virtual target, which means you can say, you can ask make to make this target. But since it's not a real target, what it would do instead is to make sure everything is up to date and run GDB automatically. So that means you know, if you make changes to your source file and you say, I'm ready to run it in the debugger again, you can say make 
main dot gdb and it will automatically bring it into the debugger itself it saves you a few keystrokes <laughs> okay but at the same time the most important part about this is it makes sure that you won't be gdbing an obsolete executable do you guys know what i mean by that no okay if you do it as a two-step process, okay, let me just illustrate what I mean by that. If you always say make, and then you run GDB all by itself separately, what if you forgot to make first? Then you'll just be saying GDB main, but that executable may be out of date. Is that making any sense? You make some changes in an editor, you get out of the editor, and then you just say GDB main without making first. <coughs> then you'll be debugging the old executable even though the source file is updated. Nothing can be more confusing or, con uh, or, uh, or frustrating than that. Because in the debugger, you'll actually be seeing the code, the new code, the changed code. But the behavior is going to be the old behavior. So you'll be, well, I would be, you know, totally confused, you know, when I look at the source code and go like, well, but this really should be adding one to I, but when I look at the behavior of the program, it's not adding one to I. That's because the source code is updated, but the executable is not. So there's a, they're not matching up, okay? But if you don't do this, instead you just say make main.gdb, this will always make, it will always update the executable first and then run GDB for you using the new updated executable. Yep? Uh, I run GDB with uh, options TUI in virtual mode. Can I still add TUI to this? You can if you want to. So what you would need to do, because I'm, I, don't, I don't use the, uh, the TUI or the GUI mode, so what you will have to do is to change the make file, and then what you need to do is to change this line here. So on, on line 27, which is the command to run GDB, you will have to either change the name of the command line. Which uh, debugger are you running? Uh, GDB. Just GDB, yeah. but you want to supply like an argument, like a dash something? Dash yeah, then you just say GDB dash TUI and then the same thing after that. You, you can customize the make file to suit your needs. Okay. Are there any questions about the make file? how to use it, not to make one, but how to, just how to use it. <coughs> oh, well, I have a question, because when I type make, I don't specify make file as a, na as a name to pass to make. That's because make file is a default file name. When you run make, it will look for the file name make file, okay? So that's why I don't need to specify dash f make file. It doesn't hurt to do it if, you, if that's what you want to do. You can say make dash lowercase f make file, which tells make to look specifically for the make file called make file. But this is totally unnecessary because make file, starting with the uppercase m, is a default make file name, and it will make will automatically look for that name without specifying it. But this will work too. It's just, you know, extra typing that does not need to happen. Are there any other questions about how to make use of a make file? That seems to be a lot of extra trouble just to get a program to compile. Is this stuff really used in industry? The answer is absolutely. Okay, you know, the Linux kernel uses make files. It does not use code blocks. <laughs> a lot of big, huge projects out there, you know, just make use of the basic tools, and that's because you know, you can. Once you set up the basic tools, you can always add other stuff on top of it, okay, to make it more visual, you know, or more automatic. But this is the, basically the basic tools that people use for development. Okay. Any other questions? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the algorithm itself, okay? We have about 10 minutes to talk about the algorithm, which is something that you should work on for you know, this class because um, 
this class is more about you know how to actually synthesize and write programs than just talking about the basic constructs of C and C++. But in this case, I'll give you, you know, give you a hand on you know, how to do this. Let's say, you know, one, zero, one, two, two is my given pattern, okay? And let's say the guess is um, one, zero, three, four, okay? How would you write an algorithm to come up with, hey, there are the zero black packs and two white packs as the score in this case? How would you do that? And the hint is you have to look for black packs first. Yep, go ahead. Um, will you check if it's in our in array, right? Yep. So you Both of these are in yeah. arrays. So yeah. you check to see if the first one, the first array guess matches the first array. And mm -hmm. do you add one to the number of how many black packs there is? That's correct. The first thing you do is to look at the first one and look at the first one in both arrays. Okay? If it matches, then you say, oh, okay, there's a match here. It is one black pack. Okay, so you need a counter to keep track of all that stuff. Then you move on to the second position of both arrays. Third position of both arrays, fourth position of both arrays. In this case, nothing matches. So the number of black packs is supposed to be zero in this case. Then you move on to the slightly more complicated part of looking for white packs. Because with white packs, what you do is you look at the first item of the first array, and then you cross-check it with the other ones, okay? All of the other ones. You can stop as soon as you find one match. In other words, if you look at this zero, the first element of hidden, and then you look at the zero of, of guess here, once you find a match, okay, then you can stop. Because any pack can only be matched exactly once. So even if I have further zeros down the line, it doesn't matter. Does that make any sense? And then I move on to this one here. I match it to this one. I can stop right there. I look at this two. There's no match here. Look at this two. There are no matches here. This is an easy case, okay? You know, in other words, e even if I make all the common mistakes in scoring, this would, be, this would not be a good test case. Let's look for a test case where problems can occur, okay? So I would have a four here and a four here. In the actual guess, I would have four and four, but they're at the wrong places, okay? Um, the rest, yeah, doesn't really matter. Okay, so only the fours are matches, okay? So once again, I look for black pegs first. In other words, I look at the pegs of each pattern at the same position. Four and zero does not match. One and four does not match. Two and four does not match. Four and five, do not, that does not match. So I have zero black packs as a score. Not a problem, that's the easy part. The difficult part is when, I look, when I'm looking for white packs. I start with this four here, and I find, hey, I have a four here. I can stop right away, because you know, remember, each peg can only be matched exactly once, right? Then I start with the one here, doesn't matter, There's, there are no matches whatsoever. In the, in the guess. The two has no matches whatsoever. Then I look up this four here. What do you think happens here? It has to match with the third. It has to match with this one. But how do, how do you make sure that you're not gonna match up with this one again? You gotta skip one. Sorry? You gotta skip one. But how do you know it? You have to remember. So whatever you have matched already, you have to change it so that it is no longer there. So you're gonna have to, so as soon as you see you have one white, you want to change that one, that value of that? So they, well, you have to do something it doesn't get, so it doesn't get matched again. So they get like a Okay, so if I want to give you something tricky, this is even trickier. How many white packs am I supposed to get? One, okay? but a careless algorithm would easily give me two because it will match the first four with the second four here. It will also match the fourth four with the second four here. If this four is not for whatever, you know, you, if you don't use any means to mark it as already matched, 
this will be matched again, so I end up with two byte packs, which is incorrect. Okay. Let me give you another example. I will have four and four matching up here, and then this four has nothing to match up to it. Okay. Two, two, and then one, four, five. Five. Once again, we have a potential problem. Because in this case, how many black packs am I, am I supposed to get? Four. Exactly one. How many white packs am I supposed to get? Zero. Okay? So the black pack is easy. Four and four matches. Increment the black packs by one. Four and one does not match. Two and five does not match. Two and five does not match. That's the easy part. Okay? Calculating the number of black packs should be done first, and that's the easier of the two processes. Now I'm on to the logic to look for white pegs. So with the white pegs, well, first of all, I have to make sure that I don't match up this four with this four again, right? Now that is not really difficult. All you need is a conditional statement to guard the, the rest of the matching logic. In other words, you have to say the index of the first uh, peg has to be different from the index of the second pattern, then do the match. Okay, you know, that's a fairly easy thing to do. Then you look up to, okay, this four does not, doesn't, you, you're not even gonna match up with this one, so it's not a non, it's a non issue. Four and one does not match, four and five does not match, four and five does not match. Even that is wrong, because this four has been matched already because of a black pack. You should not even consider it. It's like, that thing is gone. Don't even look up, look at them again. The problem is with this four here. With this four, if an algorithm is not care careful, it will easily match up with this four here and erroneously score a white peg, which is incorrect, okay? Because this four should be gone as well. In other words, what you need to do in your algorithm is to do what I do here on the whiteboard, but just using you know like usual notation. Four and four matches up cross them out. Once it is crossed out, do not match it again. It's easy to do on a whiteboard, but then you have to think about how to do it in your program. You can use additional arrays, okay? Your algorithm is can use additional arrays if you want to. Are there any questions? I'm going to change the homework assignment. I hope, I hope nobody has started yet, because what I'll do is I'm going to put an, a, 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 an additional constraint on this one, because I know someone is going to do it this way, and it's not the intended way to do it, to get it done. Okay, so I'm going to add it here. <coughs> it won't change the make file, so the, the make file you know, is going to stay the same as it is. But what I'll do is I'm going to add some const definitions here. So mmread, okay. So if you look at this code here, this is the header file. I know it's kind of hard to read. Should I, can I add a const here? Does it make sense to add a const here? Nope, does not make sense at all because you're supposed to read into the pattern member of a guest structure. If I put a const here, that means whatever PG points to, don't change any parts of it. But I do want you to change it. So const has no role to be here. What about this part here? I want you to print the score, which is the number of black packs and the number of white packs from the structure pointed to by PG. Can I use a const here and say, hey, you're not supposed to change anything in the structure. Would that be okay? That's okay, because you know we're supposed to only read certain members of the structure, not to change it. In mm score, can I add a const here? In other words, you're not supposed to change the items in the array hidden. But if you change this, you know, it means you know, every time I want you to score something, I will have to reconstruct hidden. It doesn't make any sense, right? The only thing you can change in this case is guess, okay? But, well, I will just kind of leave this one as it is here. It won't change the uh, 
the, the rest of the program. It will still compile as it is. So what I ended up doing is just adding a const here, a const here, <coughs> and then you have to figure out a way to keep track of you know which part of hidden and which part of the gas gas pattern you have uh, matched up already. And the clue is you can use additional arrays as local variables. Is that okay so far? How would you use an additional array to keep track of which part of which pattern is already matched? Yep, well, that's kind of wasteful, but yes, you can do it that way. <laughs> Did everybody catch that one? You declare two additional arrays in your function, and those arrays will have the same number of elements. And if a, an element is a zero, it means you know, a certain position of a corresponding array is already matched. If it is the other value, it is not matched yet. So you can use that as an indicator of whether a particular peg in a particular pattern is already matched. But that means you have to remember to initialize that array first as well. Okay, you basically have to initialize those additional arrays to remember that nothing has any match yet. Okay, but every time you do a match, then you remember in the other array and say, hey, don't match this again, it has to be matched already. Is that okay so far? Okay. Alrighty. Are there any questions about the algorithm? I'm gonna leave it up to you guys to come up with the algorithm. The only thing I can, I suppose I can give you a, a clue is the way I would implement it is in MM score, not including the initialization of the additional <coughs> arrays and whatnot, just for the matching, I would use one loop all on its own for the black packs, and then I'd use a nested loop for matching the white packs. A loop inside a loop. Okay? Well, it has to be a loop inside a loop because you have to say, okay, this is the element, or this is the, uh, the pack that I picked from the hidden array. I have to cross match it with everything else in the guest array. Okay, so that's why it's a double loop. The first loop, the outer loop, to control which element I'm looking here. The inner loop controls which element I'm looking here. So it has to be nested. We have one loop inside another loop. And inside the nested loop, you can use a variety of constructs. You can use conditional statements, okay, to match. You can use a ternary operator, okay, which is basically the same thing as a conditional statement. So there are quite a few ways to implement you know, what is inside the loops. Yep? So are the output should be uh, the number of black pe pegs, line B, number of white pegs? Correct. Okay, so I'll give you a sample of the input and the output. So the input is just going to be A, one space, two space, three space, four, you know, at least assuming we have four positions per pattern, and then the line bit here. Um, so this this will be the hidden pattern. The guess pattern is the next line. You know, it doesn't really matter actually. You know, but I'm just going to give it a. Okay, so I'm just going to use this particular example. Okay, so in this case we have one black peg. Okay. So the black, the number of black pack is just a number all by itself on the line, okay? And then the next line you will show the number of white pegs. In this case, how many white pegs should I be getting? Two white pegs, right? Oops. I said one, right? One and two. So these two would be the input and these two would be the output. <clears throat> now with this one, I suggest that you make test cases again, okay, so make sure that you collect and think about test cases. All the things that we talked about today, you know, especially when we talked about the algorithm, 
you know, these are good test cases to include, okay, just to make sure that you include those. And then you want to do it by hand first, figure out the number of black packs and the number of white packs, okay? And you can use your GDB script to even check on that. Okay, so depending on which input file you're using, you already know the correct answer. So that way it's easy to kind of double check your own code and make sure that it is correct. Are there any questions about this particular homework assignment? Which part do you think is gonna be the easy part? The easiest part, how about? A lot of parts are easy. MM read is super easy because you just have to copy and paste some code that is already in main.cpp, change a few things, it's all done. What about MM print score? Would that be a difficult one? You're supposed to print the number of black packs on one line and print the number of white packs on a separate line. So those two subroutines are fairly easy. The only one that is challenging is gonna be MM score. All right. So we are running out of time of the lecture. So what I will do is I'm gonna take a 10 minute break and then when we come back, I don't know. I can give you some examples of like cross-checking stuff, okay? But it's not gonna be, it's gonna be related to your homework assignment but it won't be the complete solution to your homework assignment, okay? So we'll do that in about 10 minutes. I'll stop the recorder now and restart it. Uh, when we come back.